thanks to Lydia for reading the scripture. And um, I guess by now uh, you might have understood what I'm going to speak this morning. Uh, somebody called me, uh, said that I'm like a jelly when I stick to a scripture and it's been the eighth sermon from the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and we have few more and you, may, you can notice that uh, we are reaching the end. And we'll try to finish as soon as we as it possible. But however, Anna, can you please reduce the monitor a little? Yeah. Uh, but it's been a great journey in my life personally also as I was studying the Lord's Prayer. And I do believe it has been the uh, same experience for you as well. Uh, we have reached to the second part uh, of the Lord's Prayer last, last week. Last week we dis discussed about uh, give us this day our daily bread. And this time we are going to discuss most crucial and in fact most difficult uh, part of the Lord's Prayer. And it is a very, uh, it's, it's actually, I do believe that when we truly con uh, concentrate on this prayer, when you focus on it, prayer and try to do this prayer, it scares us. Have you ever felt this uh, kind of fear in your hearts as you are praying this prayer? God forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's a scary prayer in fact. And all the parts in the prayer, they are very, uh, you know, very good and uh, they fill our hearts with hope and joy and comfort. But this prayer, this particular line, something that fills our hearts with some kind of fear. It's not just for me and you, a great uh, early church father named Augustine, St. Augustine, you might have heard about him. And he called this text as a terrible petition. He calls it it's very terrible prayer, you know. Uh, why? Because this prayer, it sounds as if there is a condition. God forgive our debts as we forgive others' debts. It seems like Jesus is saying, it's, it seems like Jesus is saying, the way you treat other people is the way God will treat you. Okay? Interpret, yeah, if you interpret those words. So, if God treats us, how we treat other people, how would it be? Just imagine. Isn't it scary? Always we may not be in our best character. Sometimes we may do charity, sometimes we may help. But if God deals with us as we are dealing with others, it's going to be a terrible experience and terrible life for all of us. That's why Augustine said it's a terrible petition. It sounds as if uh, 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 if you pray the Lord's Prayer with, uh, with an unforgiving spirit, you have virtually signed your own death warrant. Some, uh, some preacher, he said that if you are praying this prayer with an unforgiving heart towards others, you are signing on your own death warrant. And being unforgiving towards other makes this prayer a self-inflicted curse. Be because either we have to be completely good and perfect so that we can ask God to deal with us according to our perfect behavior. And if we have any sin or if we have done something wrong and if God deals with us According to that, it's going to be really horrible. As Jesus is teaching this prayer, is Jesus teaching that that is God that God's forgiveness is conditional? Many a times when we read this scripture, it fills our hearts with these thoughts: God forgive my trespasses as we forgive. The, uh, the trespassers against us. If I don't forgive them, you don't forgive me. So is Jesus is suggesting us that God is going to deal with us with a condition? So, 
in verse 12 he taught us this prayer and in verse 14 he is giving extra and additional uh, commentary to what he has already said and in uh, mark chapter 11 verse 25 okay here uh, here also he says and whenever you stand and stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. These are some of the very difficult verses for us to interpret. Is Jesus is telling us, if you don't forgive your neighbor, your father will not forgive you. If you have in what measure you are dealing with your brother, in the same measure God is going to deal with you. Is he going to te is he teaching us the same thing? No. Here in this passage, again, he is exposing, he is exposing the hypocrisy of people and he is exhibiting the spirituality of people. If you say, I know God and you do not like your neighbor. If you say that I know God, I love God, but you do not forgive your neighbor, that clearly shows that your spirituality is a hypocrisy. It is to exhibit or expose your spirituality. These words actually are here. These words are used to exhibit our spirituality or expose our spirituality. Our true spirituality can be seen only through the relationships we are in. So our relationships are the mirror to our spirituality. How godly you are, how you know God, how you are related to God will be reflected on how you deal with others. I just remember uh, one of my experiences uh, in Go I was in Goa. Uh, this is something uh, I didn't, uh, I, I, I intentionally didn't do that. But later I realized it's something imp important for us to think about. Uh, I, I was just walking down uh, from a market. I saw a man was lying on the road. He drunk, so he got drunk so much. And uh, uh, so he was not able to move and all. And it's already 7.30 and reaching 8 in Goa. You know, in Goa, one seven thirty it passes 7.30, no transport, nothing. That will be a jungle. Nobody will be walking. Okay? it's It will be a sunsan jaga. So I felt uh, this man, it may not be good for him and all. So I asked him where he lives and all. So he said where he lives. And uh, I asked him to sit in back of my bike. And so that I can drop him at his place. And uh, then he asked me, what do you do? I said, uh, uh, I, wo uh, I work in a Bible college. And all. Then he asked me, what do you teach in Bible college? Mm -hmm. and then I said, there are so many things. Uh, uh, you know, we study history, archaeology, we study uh, theological subject, we, bio, we study Bible and various other stuff. And all that. Then he asked me, tell me, what is the main teaching of your Bible college? Then uh, I didn't understand what to say. I said, uh, lo uh, love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Then this person, by being a Hindu, he said, that's what our Baba tells us, love your neighbor. What does it make difference? <laughs> then I, I didn't understand what to say. Then I told, unintentionally, I'm telling you, there is a connection between these two commandments. First commandment says, love your God with all yourself. If you love your God with all yourself, you will, you will know how to sort out with your brother. That is what it says. Love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God with all our heart will teach us how we deal with our brethren. So when we know God, it will sort our relationships first. When you come to understanding God's love, I'm not sure whether you will speak in tongues or not. I'm not sure whether you will perform miracles or not. I'm not sure whether you will prophesy or not. I'm not sure if you, you will raise the dead or heal the sick. But one thing I can tell you for sure, if you truly come to, encounter, come to have an encounter with God, you will go and try to mend your relationships. 
when we come to know god we cannot help ourselves but fix our relationships that is what here jesus is showing again okay so our relationships are the mirror of our spirituality without proper relationships public prayers and worship exposes our spirituality but how we treat people exhibits our spirituality somebody said an example a preacher was preaching really very eloquently and powerfully and uh, his wife was sitting in the crowd and somebody told her you know ye to ekdam dood ki jaisa hai he just like an angel preaching the word of god so powerfully then the wife said ye church mein dood hai ghar mein bhoot hai you know so how greatly you preach is not going to tell how spiritual you are but what your wife tells <laughs> that's what reveals your true spirituality please don't inquire with my wife <laughs> so our relationships they exhibit our spirituality or exposes our spiritual if we are not able to forgive other and you say that you know god love god and you are a hypocrite that's what not not me john said if you say that you love god and do not love your neighbor you are a liar which in other words you are a hypocrite because if you love god you cannot help yourself from loving your neighbor religion without relationship is vain that's what jesus wanted to teach when he spoke speak about this our worship is accepted only when our relationships are healthy that's what we read in mark chapter 11 if you come to worship and you have something against your brother first go and forgive and settle it and then you come and you offer your gift to god if you could not come if you could not settle it with your brother or your friend or mother or sister or your or anybody and you come to the church and offer praises to god and saying hallelujah god says please go and settle those things and come in other words your hallelujahs are because going to become uh, very uncomfortable for me when your heart is not right so Jesus said these words to exhibit or expose our spirituality. Let's see. Uh, let's look into the scripture again with this question. Did Jesus literally mean what he said? One thought we already got. He is exposing or exhibiting. In Matthew six fourteen, he said. Uh, for if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses this is the word he said is he literally mean because what is said may sound good he is exhibiting or exposing these are like i interpreted it from my pers personal experience you can say or theological perspective in a, with a particular theological perspective we interpreted and that's why we came to such conclusion but it is also important for us to make justice to the literal and uh, literal text am i right otherwise it will come to our mind again that spravins manipulation okay so this word may mean the same again we may think like that that is the reason it is important for us to understand did jesus literally mean what he said so the key to understand this question uh, so the key to understand is this uh, this following question that is who take the first step god or man when it comes to forgiveness if you answer this question that helps us to understand did really G did really jesus mean what he said to understand we go to an example jesus forgives and heals the paralytic you know the exam uh, this incident very well there was a paralytic man his friends brought him open the opening the terrace uh, sorry what we call roof and they brought him down and jesus said your sins are forgiven take up your bed and bed and walk and the, that man he took his bed and <laughs> started walking away <coughs> so the people around him were astonished and they are they said this question uh, they started asking this question and they said they are complaining against jesus saying he is blaspheming only god can forgive how can he save your sins are forgiven then jesus asked and again 
a question saying like, what is easy? What is easy? Is it to say, take away your bread and, bed and go or to say uh, your sins are forgiven? And it, uh, there is no answer in that. The, obviously, the thing is, saying your sins are forgiven is more difficult. Because we are not in the place to judge. But Jesus said those words to prove that he is God. Because God alone can forgive sins. Because the same reason the Pharisee says that. God alone can forgive sins. But how this man can say your sins are forgiven? So Jesus, he said, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. That man, he walked away. Which shows that Jesus himself is divine. And his sins are truly forgiven. That's why he walked away. So who is the first person here forgiving the sins? Is it going with the pattern? Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? No. Jesus is the one who is taking the step first. And he forgave the paralytic man. The proof? This man got healed and walked. Who took the first step? God. It is not us. And you remember, uh, people crucified Jesus. Okay? One of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is not that they have forgiven others so that you forgive them. Or it is not even they confess their sins. That's why Father, please forgive them. It is not even that Father, they felt sad or they felt guilty about their sins. So please forgive them. He said, Father, they don't even know what they are doing. Please forgive them. Who is taking the first step? Jesus. It is not us. We are not taking the first step. Jesus is taking the first step. That it is because he is the God of love and as we come to scripture we need to understand that the works of Jesus explain the words of Jesus. Many a times we take scripture and say it is said like this, it is written like this. But we don't try to interpret those words with the rest of the context. What Jesus did interprets or explains what Jesus said. We always need to keep it in our minds. And you remember the Canaanite woman who was following him to heal, heal, heal her daughter. Jesus said, I was sent to seek and save the lost sheep of Israel. If if you take those words literally and say Jesus said he came to save Israel only, then what about our salvation? We all are doomed. So, what Jesus does explains what Jesus says. Jesus was the first person who was forgiving here. That means the pattern is not when we ask, when we forgive others, God will forgive us. It is the pattern is God forgives us first. God forgives us first. And what is this? Why is it written like this? It is a hyperbole. You, we, we all know what a hyperbole is. Why do we use a hyperbole? A hyperbole is an expression we use or in which we overemphasize on certain things. Where we may mean entirely opposite to it. Okay, we overemphasize something to teach something. Like this is one among them. Jesus said, "If you if you forgive your if you forgive your neighbor, your Father in heaven will forgive. If you don't forgive your neighbor, your Father in heaven will not forgive." It is a hyperbole, and through which he is telling us, "I forgive you." That is there, and in through which he is very strongly stressing and teaching us and giving us one command: that is, you how to forgive your brother. That is the bottom line. It is not there is a pattern or a principle. When we give to others, God will give us. I mean, I'm talking about forgiveness. There is no principle here. This is just an expression. A hyperbole. Through which he is telling us, you how to forgive your neighbor. It is very crucial. If you know God, you will definitely forgive your neighbor. That's what Jesus is trying to tell. Did Jesus literally mean what he said? No. He acted, what he acted 
that's what teaches what he says and let us look at even in one other, another example that is in old testament in old testament joshua 24 verse 19 it is written but joshua said to people you cannot serve the lord for he is a holy god he is a jealous god he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins can we take these words literally and let me tell you in the entire old testament you take you don't find one example or sort one text where it is speaking about forgiveness where god is saying i'm forgiving their sins everywhere in ot it's not operation theater it's old testament everywhere in the old testament we find this pattern so the priest shall make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him so unless there is an atonement done the forgiveness was not extended that's how it seems okay but what about psalms 103 verse 3 where it says god who forgives all iniquities who heals all your diseases actually if you read the scripture on the top it looks like there is no concept of forgiveness in the old testament at all god never god doesn't forgive anyone as it is said in joshua or if you wants to forgive there should be an atonement unless blood is shed for there there won't be any forgiveness there is, this is the words people use it always unless uh, without bleeding of shedding of the blood there is no forgiveness the reality is without shedding of the blood there is no forgiveness not from god without shedding of the blood there is no help for us to receive the forgiveness that's what it mean it doesn't mean god cannot forgive unless you give blood it mean you cannot accept his forgiveness unless you offer something because this is a psychological problem we all humans have and was psalm 130 verse 4 it is said uh, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared here it is written there is forgiveness with you that's why we adore you we worship you we come to you but you don't find anything if you read over on, on on the top in the old testament anywhere the concept of forgiveness but the children of israel at least the psalmist they experience the forgiveness of the lord if god did not forgive the children of israel do you think that for uh, these many years they would survive book of judges every time god uh, brings them out they go and sin and they again they go back into captivity that is the pattern book of judges is a good picture for entire old testament they sin they will go into captivity god they repent god brings them out again they will sin they will go into captivity that is a picture unless god is forgiving the nation of israel would have not survived that itself is a proof and only one place you will find the forgiveness of god in the old testament that is when it talk about the new covenant in jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34 i will forgive their iniquity i'll forgive their iniquity and their sin i will remember no more here again looking at reading at old testament so a lot of people say god in the old testament is so harsh not like in the god in the new testament did and we need to ask the question did really god mean what he said the answer is the works of god explains the works of god his mercy and forgiveness and how he sustained the nation of israel teaches how gracious he is having said that let us move forward about forgiving others and you may say okay god will forgive and in from old testament you are saying there is a uh, no need for any atonement god has forgiven the children of israel but the atonement was given for the people to accept the forgiveness of god and what about the parables in the new testament and one among those parables that troubles us very much is parable of unforgiving servant you know the story very well there was a man who has taken a very huge uh, who has very huge debt and his master forgives him and this fellow goes and uh, he put he put somebody who has taken a very small amount uh, who borrowed a small amount from him and then he was brought to the master and said this for you forgave him such uh, from his such a huge debt but this fellow he was not able to forgive the other fellow who uh, who has taken a small amount of money from him then the master uh, puts him in outer darkness 
so here it it looks as if you know god is if this because this person did not forgive the other person the master brought him back and put him in the prison again this goes back to the same pattern forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us this fellow did not forgive the other person that's why the master did not forgive him but put him in the outer darkness or he has it, the literal word used was the literal word used was uh, torturers given him over to torturers the reality is again this is not the same principle again there is a mystery here that we need to understand. If we read Matthew chapter 18, verse 26 to 27, it tells us why this fellow was not able to forgive. Matthew 18, verse 26 to 27, if we read, we find, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Here, look at the attitude of the person. The attitude of the person is not, Master, I am not in a position to pay. Please help me out. But the, the attitude is, I will pay every bit, every penny of it. He has such a huge debt. Do you really think he would be able to pay? No. His attitude is, I don't require the forgiveness of the Master. He did not forgive because he never had the humble heart that is seeking forgiveness when he had such a debt. That is the very reason he is not able to forgive others. And it is the same with us. We will be able to forgive if we have the grace of feeling forgiven. We will be able to forgive only when we are humble before God and we seek for his forgiveness. And we will be able to forgive only when we are able to receive the forgiveness of God and we dwell on it. If we forget the forgiveness of God, we may not be able to forgive others. If any of us are not able to forgive others, that means we have already forgotten that God has forgiven us. Or we did not have the attitude or humility of seeking forgiveness from the Lord at all. Those are the reasons behind we being unforgiving towards people. And let me tell you, unfor unforgiving towards others and uh, ask God for forgiveness is a kind of spiritual, spiritual uh, schizophrenia. That's all. Two, uh, two uh, like, you know, poles in their own mind, in their two, two standards in their own mind. So, if anyone who is in touch with the forgiveness they received, they will be able to extend the forgiveness to the others. In Matthew chapter, what about master putting him in the, giving him to the torturers? Matthew chapter 13 verse 34, it says, and his master was angry and delivered him to torturers until he should pay all the, uh, all that was due to him. Take, taking these many people say oh there is forgiveness from the Lord but you have to pay the consequence for it definitely I, I, I accept when we do some decisions we definitely face the consequences for that that does not uh, mean you know with God always it is about consequences forgiveness is not always about consequences that's what we need to understand so here the master put this fellow handed over him to torturers that's what written here. Handed him over to the torturers. What are these? Uh, uh, what? Who are these torturers? Somebody said, the hidden torturers of anger and bitterness that eat us inside out. The torturers of frustration. Sorry, the torturers of frustration. The malice gives ulcers and blood pressure and migraine headaches. The tortures that make us lie awake at night, stewing over every rotten thing that happened to us. These are the torturers God, the master had given over. When we are not able to forgive others, we are given to these, these torturers. And these torturers, these torturers are not who are outside. You know, they walk from within side. Within us. Okay. Because we have forgotten 
the joy of forgiveness that's why when uh, david prays give me the joy of your salvation you know many a times we christians we forget the joy of forgiveness joy of salvation we when we forget the forgiveness we receive we won't be able to forgive others and i heard a story there was a, a preacher uh, who was working in us and in his area there was a big uh, army officer and the army officer came to the preacher and said i will never i will never forgive you then this man said then uh, sir you have to be perfect because if unless you are perfect you will be okay and if you are not perfect and you are you are, if you are having unforgiving heart you are going to be given into the hands of these torturers that's what he said so unless we are in touch with our forgiveness we won't be able to forgive others only the person who feels the forgive who feels forgiven is capable of forgiving and the family is a big training gym for the mutual giving and forgiveness without which love it it cannot last for long it's a good uh, gym for us where we can practice our forgiveness and what well, one last thing i will bring before you and close what is this forgiving as god forgives because the same verse was interpreted as uh, like this also forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us so there is a pattern it seems like that because of the conjunction word conjunction word as and that word can be translated as also the word can be translated as and just imagine reading the word forgive our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us what is the meaning it changes the conjunction uh, i was just looking at various words how we can look at the, the proper translation and all and uh, i was almost tempted to put the word and there but again i wanted to reconfirm so i went and wanted wanted to search are there any early church fathers or anybody translated like that i searched but could not find then i realized no 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 that was then i realized it was a hyperbole <laughs> okay so forgiving as god forgives what we do in forgiving another this is from a this is a portion i have taken from the lectures we received uh, in my last semester and i'm uh, i have cut down into points what we do in forgiving another is something quite different from what god does in his act of forgiveness the way we forgive the way god forgives is entirely different it is not the same we can never undo the guilt of a sin when it when it is committed against us for we cannot undo it or even forget it can we undo anything wrong no we don't have the power can we forget unless we lose our memory no we cannot forget we cannot undo what has actually been done nor can we put the clock back as it were and thus forget is uh, forget it is if it had never been so we cannot do that but god can do both sorry but god can do both because sin is stamped or qualified as sin in uh, in that he judges it as sin but unlike god we cannot do so even when we forgive it god judges sin can we judge sin no when he forgives he judges sin and he removes the sin and uh, uh he forgets it forever we cannot therefore argue from the fact of human forgiveness to divine forgiveness uh, that simply assumes that god will forgive because we do we cannot forgive like god do so we cannot think our forgiveness is like the forgiveness that god offers that is to come to dangerously near to think uh, that all god does in forgiveness is simply to remove his wrath or lift his judgment against against us that's what we think where the moment we talk about forgiveness we think oh god forgive us means he is not angry with us anymore and he is not going to bring judgment on us these are the only two thoughts we have in our mind am i right 
when you talk about God's forgiveness, but it is not so. It is much more deeper than that. The forgiveness of God is is uh, not just God is uh, God is giving away His wrath, but He is destroying the sin itself, and He is removing the memory of the sin also, and He is not going to remember the sin anymore. When we forgive others who sin against us, as uh, God has forgiven us, all we can really do, as far as it is possible for us, is to put away our resentment against them. So forgiving as God forgiving is not like uh, is not something that we can do. God alone can forgive in full sense where he can remove the entire sin. But we cannot do that. Only thing we can do is we give up our rights and we stop being angry about someone else. And if you don't do that, what happens? We know about the tortures. Right? So we forgive. So when we forgive, we give up our resentment and feelings of vengeance. That's what we do. So we need to forgive others because it is good for us. In this sense, the prayer becomes a blessing unto us. When we pray, when we forgive others, we won't be given to those tortures. So it is becoming good for us. In the first sense, if you take it as a principle, if you forgive, God will forgive. If you don't forgive, God will not forgive. In that sense, what happens? It will become a self-inflicted curse upon us. But if you consider in this perspective that what Jesus said was a hyperbole, and God is the one who initiates forgiveness always. And when he forgives, he removes the sin completely, even from the memory. And when we exercise, when we extend the, sorry, when we extend the same forgiveness on others, towards others, we take our rights again. Uh, I mean, be, when we, we take our rights to be a resentful against them. So when we do that, we keep ourselves away from the tortures. This is good for us. Forgiving others uh, is participating in the life of God. God is doing something. God is in the business of forgiving the entire world. And when we forgive, we are participating with him. When can we do that? When we are key, when we are constantly focusing on the forgiveness that God had given to us. Uh, if you don't uh, remember, if you don't put our minds on what God had given to us, then we won't be able to forgive. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it reminds us not to neglect this great salvation. When we neglect the great forgiveness of God, we won't be able to forgive others. When we neglect the great salvation of the Lord, we won't be able to experience the life. And uh, somebody said, unbelievers die because they did not receive salvation. And many of the believers die because they neglect their salvation. So unbelievers suffer pain in their life because they did not experience the forgiveness. We experience pain because we neglect the forgiveness of God and we won't be able to, we won't uh, extend it, extend the same to others. So after this long stretch sermon, my conclusion is this. This prayer such as, such as our spiritual reality, which is relational. This prayer humbles us, reminding we live by the mercy and forgiveness of God. And this prayer reminds us about the great forgiveness we have received from God. And this prayer challenges us to share the forgiveness that we receive and helps us to be healthy spiritually, emotionally and physically. This prayer invites us to participate in the life of God. So when we pray, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is what the prayer does. It is not a self-inflicted curse, but this is a blessing that keeps us healthy emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. As much as we focus on the forgiveness of the Lord, we forgive others and we live the life of God in its fullness. May God bless you.